Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the 10th Annual Opus Prize Awards Ceremony. My name is Tom Banchoff. I'm Vice President for Global Engagement here at Georgetown and Director of our Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And I want to thank you all for joining us on this beautiful fall day, a bit chilly, but beautiful nevertheless. Uh, the Opus Prize is a unique award that recognizes pioneers inspired by faith who work day in and day out to address pressing humanitarian problems across the globe. In our world, with its conflicts, poverty, inequality, and natural disasters, the Opus Prize lifts up leaders determined to make a difference, leaders working in communities to address human suffering and advance human dignity, often across religious and cultural lines. It's really in a a remarkable award, and Georgetown University, our whole community, our students, our faculty, our staff, and our alumni, we are honored to be partners with the Opus Prize Foundation on this year's selection process. It's now my pleasure to introduce our president, Dr. John J. DeJoya. Dr. DeJoya is the 48th president of Georgetown University, a position he's held since 2001. And under his leadership, Georgetown has emerged as an innovator among higher education institutions in connecting the university's core educational mission of teaching and research with service to the wider world. Examples include our university-wide initiatives around issues of global human development, global health, Catholic social thought and public life, and interfaith dialogue, all areas related to the mission of the Opus Prize. Please join me in welcoming President Jack DeJoya. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I wanna to thank all of you for being with us this afternoon. It's a privilege for us to welcome all of you to Georgetown University and to Copley Formal Lounge for this ceremony to announce the winner of the 2013 Opus Prize. One of the largest faith-based humanitarian awards in the world, the Opus Prize recognizes the outstanding contributions of individuals and organizations working to solve some of our world's most challenging problems. Georgetown is honored to partner with the Opus Prize Foundation and to support the recognition of these three extraordinary finalists, each of whom have made a disproportionate impact towards the betterment of our global family. To this year's Opus Prize finalists, the Famina Institute, Sister Carol Kean, and Dr. Sakina Yakubi, congratulations and thank you. I also wish to thank Don Nyrider and the Opus Prize Foundation for their commitment to highlighting these leaders as well as to Georgetown's Vice President for Global Engagement, Tom Banchoff, the Berkeley Center, and all of the members of our community who have played a role in this year's prize celebrations. We're grateful for your partnership and your engagement. Selected through a rigorous nomination process, these, quote, unsung heroes, close quote, eminently deserve our recognition and our gratitude for providing such inspired examples of service and faith. Their work to provide health care and education for the poor, to promote the role of women, to provide opportunities for a deeper understanding of faith, speaks to a perspective that animates our work here at Georgetown. This perspective, embodied by each of our finalists, is motivated by an ethos of care, by an appreciation of faith, and a belief in new possibilities. Whether working in Indonesia, Afghanistan, the United States, or multiple other locations across the globe, these finalists remind us of the ideas expressed here in our context by the earliest Jesuits of the idea of working at the frontiers. As a university community in the Jesuit tradition, we are asked to, 
In the words of the Superior General of the Society of Jesus, Father Adolfo Nicolas, to quote, embrace new frontiers, to live our, our lives at the frontiers. These frontiers go beyond geographic definition. We are called to work at the frontiers of connectivity and human development, at the frontiers of deeper interpersonal understanding across faiths, cultures, and traditions. We are asked to see and to serve those who are forgotten, excluded, the stranger in our midst, the voiceless and the powerless. When we live at the frontiers, as each of these finalists do, we work at the forefront of what is possible. We seek out new learning and knowledge, new ways of leading and being, new ways of understanding others and ourselves. This embrace of the frontiers provides us with an idea of a way of life that seeks to bring together diverse ideas and disciplines in a way that enables us to seek and fulfill the call to be our very best selves. The members of the Famina Institute, Sister Carol, Dr. Yakubi, demonstrate for us the possibilities of such a life. And through their example, by learning from them and honoring them, we have the opportunity to better, under, better understand the contributions that each of us can uniquely make in service to the betterment of humankind. Dr. Sakina Yakubi, Sister Carol Kean, and Hussein Muhammad, Faki Kuder, and Mustasira Lis Marcos of the Famina Institute. We are grateful to you for your presence. We are honored by the chance to celebrate you today and to recognize you as finalists of the 2013 Opus Prize. So at this time, I would like to invite each of you, each of our finalists, to be seated on our stage. Please join me in congratulating each of them. Again, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today for this ceremony, and now it's my privilege to introduce our Vice President of Mission and Ministry, Father Kevin O'Brien, to offer an invocation on today's event. As we uh, gather here this afternoon for this uh August occasion, we know that our brothers and sisters in the Philippines are suffering greatly, so we spend just a few moments of silence in prayer for the repose of all the dear souls lost and all those suffering in their wake and all those who are coming to their aid. The psalmist proclaims, O Lord, O Lord, how admirable is your name in the whole earth. Your magnificence is elevated above the heavens. We behold your heavens and see the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have founded. On the occasion of the announcement of the Opus Prize, we are so filled with gratitude for the gifts of this day, the gifts of the earth, the gift of mind and heart and spirit that come from you. We thank you for creating a universe that is knowable and for filling us with a desire to know it, for making it beautiful and for inviting us to enjoy it, for letting us live freely in it and for charging us to tend and keep it. We ask you to bless our nominees who each in their own way reflect your divine compassion and holy persistence. 
Inspire in us zeal and wisdom like theirs so that we can make this world a more just and gentle place, a more human place. We give you thanks for the Opus Prize Foundation and all their benefactors and, an a- and ask you to inspire in us a generosity of time and talent and treasure. All we have, all you have given us, dear Lord, we now offer in the service of others and in the praise of you, our God, whom we call by different names, but whose children we all are one. And so we say together, Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. The Opus Prize is an all too rare recognition of the special people and organizations that work tirelessly to address the world's most intractable problems and who see possibilities and promise even in the darkest situations. They inspire us with their courage and creativity and their determination to act. The prize is also unique in its partnership with universities and focus on students. Thus, it has been a special privilege for Georgetown to host the 10th Opus Prize for 2013. An 18-month-long process has involved many parts of the university. A wonderful steering committee oversaw the process. It helped to identify from our broad network the anonymous nominators, or secret spotters, whose identity is a carefully guarded secret. The steering committee helped to identify a distinguished jury that met in March Uh, and carefully reviewed the nominations. They recommended the three finalists to the Opus Prize Foundation Board. A fundamental part of the board's review and final decision has been the input of Georgetown faculty and students. You will be hearing from the three students who were involved in this process this year and see how much they drew from their involvement. And the three finalists have now spent two busy days on campus, visiting classes and meeting with student groups. In that vein, I pay special tribute to my colleagues at the Berkeley Center, especially Aaron Taylor, who've spared no effort to make this event a great success. The process has clearly enriched our university, and we have great hopes that it will open new doors for our energies and commitment. What we will do now is we will hear uh, from the three students, uh, see short videos about each of the three finalists, and then hear brief remarks by each of the finalists. So to start this process, I'd like to welcome Annie Devine, a master's student in the Global Human Development Program, who will introduce Sakina Yakubi. I have the very great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Sakina Yakubi, human rights activist, women's advocate, educationalist, president and founder of the Afghan Institute for Learning. Through her work in Afghanistan, she's inspired many, and from my interactions with her and her colleagues over the past couple of days, I have grown to understand why, and simultaneously begun to consciously re-explore the intersection of faith and community service How could you not as we stand here to honor this group of people? In preparing this introduction, I asked myself why I was selected with this honor. The simple reason is that I had the opportunity to work and live in Afghanistan for two years on education programs specifically. It seemed for all intents and purposes the logical choice. However, my story started before Afghanistan. Much like the founders of the Opus Awards, who instilled a sense of service in each of their children, and Sakina's father, who instilled in her the importance of education, my parents gave me a similar gift. From the time I was very young, every Monday evening after dinner, we walked to church community center to set up beds for homeless women to sleep in. 
It was that simple act and many others that led me on my personal path of community service at home and abroad. That is why I'm here to speak about a very special woman who lives and embodies the intersection of faith and service into, to her community. Sakina Yakubi has spent decades dedicated to the people of Afghanistan, specifically the women and children, empowering them through education. She recognizes the ability education has to transform lives of individuals, communities, and ultimately societies. Today, at a pivotal moment in Afghan's history, education and social services are even more pressing. Sakina founded the Afghan Institute of Learning after four years working with refugees in Pakistan. AIL is a grassroots Afghan women-led organization that focuses on educating, educating women and children, providing ep economic empowerment for women, as well as health and education services to the poor and disenfranchised. To date, AIL has supported 332 learning centers, trained over 20,000 teachers, conducted numerous training programs for women on a wide range of topics, established a hospital and 15 health clinics. The numbers are impressive, but it is Sakina's unique and quickly recognizable energy that drives her in her work for betterment of Afghanistan and empowerment of its women that is truly impressive. Speak with her for just a few moments Ask her about the importance of educating women, the role of religion in her life as a pillar of strength, and the work of AIL, and you will quickly understand why I'm standing here today introducing you to you, her as a finalist for the very prestigious Opus Awards. Now I'd like to turn your attention to the video screen uh, so we can learn a little bit more about her work. When I was growing up in Afghanistan, it was a beautiful country. Life was so simple. People were very friendly. People trusted each other. Today's life is so different because of the war, because of the situation in Afghanistan. I believe that the heart of Islam is to really be peaceful, really to be gentle with each other, and to be just. I'm Sakina Yakubi. I am the founder and president of Afghan Institute of Learning. First thing that it's really motivated me to found the Afghan Institute of Learning was really the women and children of Afghanistan. I hear this horrible story about how they are being killed, how they are being raped. And when I went to the refugee camp, <laughs> it was, that's it for me. It was, at that moment, as soon as I arrived, I saw children, I saw women, how much they suffered. All these people, homeless, they were poor, they were miserable. I said, I have to do something. And what could I do as an individual? How could I help them? I felt it, what happened to education? What it did to me? I'm a different person. I said, that's what I'm going to after education. I really wanted to teach my people critical thinking so they will be self-sufficient. The core of Afghan Institute of Learning is teacher training because we believe that if you have a good teacher in the classroom, no matter how poor the people are, they stay in the classroom. And then we're just uh, going to come to camp and trying to set up the school. It wasn't easy to bring a system of education to the refugee camp in which there wasn't a government, but we started through community. They feel this is their program. It's not that I'm imposing on them. They feel this is theirs. AIL is not only working in education, it's working to make a better human being, to really transform people, to really set up their mind in a way that they be a better citizen. And so we set up 80 school inside Afghanistan. It wasn't just a school. It was a community activity that it really raised the standard of life in the community. I believe in God, and I believe that when we do something good, the outcome will be good too, and it did happen. The people of Afghanistan are uh, not the same people that they have been before. They change. They want to go forward with their life. They do not want fight. Afghan people are kind. They are smart. 
they really need a chance to really be different. Our religion are constantly telling us that we are peaceful. The first word, salam, means peace. We say peace upon you. And that is the meaning of Islam. So please give us some chance and some time. They need your assistance. They need your help to rebuild their life. I would now like to welcome Dr. Sakina Yakuba um, to say a few words. First of all, I, would, I am just honored to be here. It's a wonderful place with wonderful people. Thank you very much for your generosity to give me this floor. People are asking me, why do you do what you do? What is the reason? My answer is that, first of all, I love my country. I love my people. I work in Afghanistan because my heart is in Afghanistan. When you go in a place like Afghanistan, and you see that for 40 years, the country has been devastated. The children has been abused. The women have been abused. The system of education has been completely demolished. The country has been completely demolished. The beautiful Afghanistan that I saw is not there. The wonderful people who are hospitable and generous, they are not there. The people who live there, they are nervous. They are traumatized. You see, Millions of landmines inside Afghanistan. You see women and children, they are losing their lamb, their hand, their foot, their whatever. And when you see those kind of situation, how cannot you do something? About all of those things, people live in poverty. Poverty destroying Afghanistan. There are the times that I, I remember when I was in Afghanistan growing up as a little girl. We didn't have really uh, somebody to come in back in our door. Rarely you could see somebody. Today you go to Afghanistan, you are in the street, hundreds of children surrounding you, bagging you, because they are trying to support their family. Today in Afghanistan, people live in Afghanistan. They came back from refugee camp from Pakistan. Seven million were refugee. But today they are inside Afghanistan, they don't have a home. They are struggling to parent. They are struggling to build a shelter for themselves because the land is so expensive and they could not afford to buy a piece of land. Today Afghanistan is not the, the Afghanistan that I know and I remember. So for me, it is very hard to see Afghanistan like that. What I could do, as I said in the movie you saw, as an individual, you cannot do that much. You must, first of all, you must have some, some power that you really believe strongly, that that power carry you, and that's me. I'm a spiritual person. I believe in God, and I think God is with me everywhere. Yes, it's a very task, hard task to do what we did or what we are doing. But you know, I believe that God created us to do the best, the most, and reach out for each other. Love each other, have compassion, have wisdom, have generosity, and share. Today's world, people are not sharing with each other. Today's world is a world that everybody is for themselves. So that is really motivate me to do something for Afghanistan. And that things, what could be to change their life, to transform them, to make them to have self-confidence, to make them to speak for themselves, to make them to not be afraid, to make them that this is their right, as a human's right. Every individual has a right in education. Every individual has a right for a good living. Every individual has a right for uh, good health. 
Why the people of Afghanistan should be different? Aren't they human beings? Didn't God create them equal to us? He did. But what happened? For 40 years, people running into my country and uh, sort of just barbarically killing people. And that is really very tough to accept. We must say no. Stop it. Stop this. We are human beings. We have an equal right. There is justice. Justice must be done. And how we do that? Through education. Look, all of you are here. It's a fantastic university with a higher education. How long it took you to get this education? So for Afghanistan, it's not going to be a long, pro it's short process. It will take time. But we are there to transform. And I'm telling you that we have done that. We transform life after life. Today, the people of Afghanistan are not the same people. The women of Afghanistan are not the same women, that they will be scared and they will not be able to talk. Today, the women of Afghanistan are in power. They have confidence. They have job. They do trade business. They go from one country to another country. They earn an income. They are the head of the household. And still, they are going to do more. And I want to share this news with you, that don't feel pity for them. They are strong and they have dignity. Respect them and believe in them. And, and that is the people of Afghanistan wants. That's the reason I'm here to share with you that the people of Afghanistan really are proud people. They want their dignity back. But they are going to accomplish it. And they already have done. Yes, you hear the news. Yes, you know that today or tomorrow, the NATO ally will leave us. Are we scared? Yes. Are we quitting? No. We are going to be as strong as God wants us, and we will be winning this. We are not going to allow those people to come and take our life again. We are going to fight it. How we are going to fight? With education. Our people will gain knowledge. Our people will be educated. Our people will ask questions. Our people choose a good leader. Democracy is in Afghanistan. Everybody wants us to be democratic. Democracy is not going to be handed to people. Democracy is the rule of law. The people of Afghanistan must know what is the rule of law, how we practice the rule of law. Why is it so important that we really know the process of democracy? Because we want to choose our leader. We want to choose the leader to stand up for us. Do not leave us alone. Stand up for the women's right. Stand up for the children's right. That kind of leader. And those people now know. They are not going to choose leader just by name as a leader. And I am very proud of my staff. I have a fantastic staff. They stay beside me years after year. They work very, very hard, and they are very successful for their accomplishment. I dedicate my entire work to my staff and to my people, because they are really wonderful human beings, and they work very, very hard. And they are not working for money. They work from the heart. If it was for money, they are not making any money as close as any international uh, organization. But they choose to work with AIL, because they know AIL provide quality education. AIL provide quality training, and AIL is for the people of Afghanistan. And I know my time is running, but <laughs> I could talk forever here. Anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakina. Uh, I'd li like now to welcome Ted Hooley, a uh, master's student in the Global Human Development Program, uh, who will introduce Sister Carol Kean. Um, it's an honor to introduce Sister Carol to you all, and it's been a real pleasure to spend time with her over these past couple of days. Um, I'm sure anyone that has had the pleasure to meet her um, can attest to the kind and warm person that she is, and that's uh, prize-worthy in itself, I think. 
Um, Sister Carol has fought tirelessly to expand the right to health care for the poor and underserved in the United States. And as the president and CEO of the Catholic Health Association, has overseen the provision of health services to millions of Americans that would not receive care otherwise. As a student in the Global Human Development Program and a member of the Georgetown community, uh, I couldn't be happier that we all had the opportunity to get to know the work that Sister Carol has accomplished throughout this whole process. Um, she truly embodies the values of this university. Um, and I hope uh, those are the same values that I hope to live in my, in my own life. Um, and these are the values to you, of, of commitment to serve, service of faith and the promotion of justice and the obligation to take head on the realities of poverty, oppression, and injustice in the United States and all over the world. Georgetown as an institution endeavors to have all students hear and act upon the call to serve others, both now as students and throughout their entire lives. And there isn't a better example of this profound devotion to others than Sister Carol. As someone studying global health, she inspires me as I go forth from Georgetown in the pursuit of a career um, in expanding healthcare coverage to the poor and underserved. I hope that everyone who meets Sister Carol also feels that fire that burns for others in our hearts kindled stronger after learning not only about the amazing work that she does, but how she has done it, humbly, tirelessly, accompanying all those she helps serve. Now please join me in watching Sister Carol's video. Faith is a bedrock of my life. And my faith tells me how compelling the admonition is of Jesus Christ to serve the most vulnerable. How intolerant Christ was in the gospel of those who took advantage of, of the vulnerable. And then my own experience of working in a hospital as a nurse aide, as a registered nurse, as a supervisor of nursing, vice president of nursing, and as a CEO, I've seen time and time again the challenges and the, and the pain that not having health insurance brings. Catholic healthcare plays a really important role in the health of our country. We've always been a, a strong partner with the local community. We adhere very strongly to Catholic social teaching and Catholic medical moral teaching. In the United States today, one out of every six people who goes into a hospital goes into a Catholic hospital. There is still an absolute need for Catholic health care. In the United States, the richest nation in the world, we have between 48 and 50 million people who don't have any health insurance. We can't have a strong, vibrant, economy and a strong, vibrant family life if we deny so many of our families health care. The Institute of Medicine says that we have in this country 18,000 unnecessary deaths a year. For four out of every 10 cancer survivors, the good news was they survived. The bad news was they were bankrupt. That's not a pro-life agenda. That's not speaking for the dignity of every human being. I am sick and tired of people who wait on us hand and foot not having basic health insurance. My faith tells me that we have to serve them. I take four vows, poverty, chastity, obedience, and a fourth vow of service of the poor. If I can't reach out and make their lives better, then I'm not spending my life the right way. Please join me in welcoming Sister Carol for some remarks. Ted, thank you for that very kind introduction. It's been an equal pleasure to spend two days with you. Um, and you've kept me on the straight and narrow, which is hard to do. <laughs> uh, good afternoon to all of you. And let me say first and foremost, thank you to the Opus Foundation not only for um, letting me be one of your finalists, but letting me meet the other two finalists, and for the work you've done over the years with this tremendous, tremendous prize. Uh, 
I want to thank the jurors and the steering committee and the anonymous spotters um, for the great work that they, they've done and the, the effort they put into it. In a special way, I want to thank the Round Horse family. I've had the joy of serving with the, some members of the family on various boards, and um, I never knew your mother, but I've served with your dad on boards and have gotten to know him over the years. And while many people look at your family and say well, how successful your mom and dad were in their businesses because, as you point out, they came from farming families, they were far more successful in raising their family because they have not only been committed to sharing the blessings God gave them, but they've raised children who are committed and, and who keep this going and who find ways to share that with other people and particularly with other students. I also want to thank President Jack DeJoya and the staff and faculty at Georgetown, and in a special way, the students of Georgetown. Jack, I know I don't have to tell you what great students you have. They are incredibly bright and incredibly gracious, um, and I hope going through this process and going through their studies, they get an even deeper sense of how much the world needs the talent and commitment that they have, and how much they can do with the great gifts God has given them. Lastly, I would say to all of us, as citizens of this great country, we often look out and say, what can we do to help developing worlds? And in some ways, I think we need to also say, as a family in this nation, we need to be very careful that we take care of our family as well as going out. We do not leave our family. And as long as 48 to 50 million people in this country who work hard every day don't have access to health care for themselves and their children, we've not taken care of even our own family. And we will not be the example to the world that the world needs um, speaking for the dignity of every man, woman, and child. So we should all be committed to our family and the family of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sister Carol. Uh, we will now hear from Fred Mesner, a senior in the School of Foreign Service, who will introduce us to the Famina Institute. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, and um, I'm thrilled to be here today to introduce Fahmina, and I'd first like to thank uh, Catherine Marshall and Father Dan Madigan for bringing me into this process and giving me the opportunity to meet this incredible group of people. In July of this year, I had the opportunity to travel to Indonesia, uh, which is the world's most populous Muslim country and a nation facing profound challenges related to poverty, human development, and more recently, religious sectarianism and intolerance. Rising from the Pesantren system of mostly impoverished Muslim um, boarding schools, Fahmina has turned into an organization that is on the front lines facing these challenges, and the breadth of their work is truly staggering. They serve as a community organizer, as a political advocate, and as an educator, while at the same time developing and preaching a doctrine of Islam that is based on a foundation of tolerance equality, and pluralism. They have, to provide a few examples, organized street vendors to negotiate with the local government. They have provided sex education to villagers who previously had no access. And most importantly, what's at the heart of their work and the core of their faith-based community service is they have founded a religious college that is openly challenging the well-funded fundamentalist movement that is moving through Indonesian society. This versatility has made Fahmina a pillar of their Chitabon community and a first resort for Indonesians in need. It is striking the degree of trust that their community places in them. Civil society leaders, ordinary individuals, and even the local government with whom Fahmina is usually on the opposite side of the table all rave about Fahmina's integrity and their commitment to raising the standard of living of their community. 
And Fahmina's work has not only reached Indonesia. Their leaders have been invited to speak all over Southeast Asia to share their perspective on faith-based community service. And I'm excited that we now have allowed them to reach the entire world. When I first met Kang Hussein, um, I found that our most comfortable common language was actually Arabic. It wasn't English, and it wasn't Indonesian. So I would like to close with an excerpt from a hadith, a, uh, a saying attributed to the Prophet Muhammad that I feel brings out um, what Fahmina tries to do in their community. So that line is, Wallahu fi awni al-abd, makana al-abdu fi awni akhihi, which means God helps the servant as long as the servant helps his brother. And with that, I'd like to turn your attention towards the screen. My name is Kamala Chandra Kirana, and I'm a member of the board in Fahmina. Fahmina was founded exactly one year after a big political change in 1998 when the whole country went through a process of democratization. Kiai Hussein Muhammad, a teacher of Islam, and his students basically came together uh, to set up an NGO that they call Fahmina. They wanted to find a way so that the teachings of Islam can be part of the redefining of Indonesia. Fahmina engages in an effort of cultural transformation to create a society that lives democratically, that believes in pluralism, that ensures justice for everyone. The founders of Fahmina has always uh, felt disturbed by the contradictions between the Islam that they believe in and the reality in which violence against women are often justified in religious terms. Fahmina then came up with an alternative interpretation and reading of Islam where women were seen as equal to men. Fahmina has a very strong foundation in theology, and yet it's not just about ideas. It engages in the issues of poverty, injustice, discrimination. Fahmina is at, at a critical juncture in its history. The challenges are much deeper than we ever expected. It's almost a shock for us. After 15 years working so hard, it's almost a shock to see just how much further we still have to go. Fahmina needs to find a new generation of people who will continue the work, but with boldness to find new ways. We want to build a new culture of equality, of justice. This is Fahmina's vision, that Fahmina becomes a catalyst for this kind of change in society, a real, genuine, deep cultural change, not just a change in the formal institutions of government, but in who we are as, as a people. I'm pleased now to invite Lise Marcos, Hussein Mohammed, and Faki Kodir to the microphone. Thanks and Mashukran, Fred, in the Mumtaz. In the name of God, the merciful and compassionate, Assalamu alaikum and blessing of prosperity to us all. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me on behalf of the Family Institute to stand in this distinguished venue amongst such highly respectful people. Today is a, a historic moment for us, and in light of this, I give praise to the Almighty God. It is with great pride that we accept the first prize as it represents the attention and appreciation of the world community to effort of local communities to develop themselves and lead the way toward a better and more just society that upholds universal values for all humanity. We wish to express our heartfelt thanks for this honor. For 13 years now, 
we have devoted ourselves to this work. We recognize that our work faces many challenges and requires personal friends and as, as well as the support of many parties. In this context, the Opus Prize is truly a blessing that will strengthen us further. We believe that life is most meaningful when we work together to find ways to reduce human suffering and to share happiness. Surely, we all share this, that this trust that God will not ignore our common work for the good of humankind. Finally, as Plato said, in the ibta fil birri, fa inna al birra yabqa, wa taaba yazul. Wa inil tazazta bil asam, fa inna al lazata tazul, wal asam tabqa. If you feel tired from your good works, the benefit will be eternal, and the fatigue will disappear. If you feel enjoyment from your sinful deeds, the enjoyment will fade and the sin will be eternal. With this award, we are committed to continuing our work in developing social works and religious discourse in Indonesia. Thank you again for this award. May God bless us all. Amen. Thank you. Again, it has been an honor for us to celebrate each of the finalists of this year's Opus Prize and have the opportunity to learn about their inspiring work. And it's now my privilege to announce the recipients of the two $75,000 awards and the $1 million winner of the 2013 Opus Prize. Okay. So it is my pleasure to announce our first award for $75,000. We heard today of this finalist's contribution to civil society and community empowerment in Indonesia, its engagement on issues of religious pluralism, gender, democracy, and human rights, and its work as a center for progressive Islamic research, teaching, and outreach. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege to award the first award of $75,000 to the Famina Institute. Congratulations. I'd like to announce the second winner of the $75,000 award. We recognize this finalist for her compassionate leadership, dedicated service to the poor, and for her efforts to promote health care for our world's most vulnerable. It is my pleasure to award the second $75,000 award to Sister Carol Kean. Congratulations to our two award recipients of the $75,000 prize. And now it's my great honor to announce the million dollar Opus Prize winner for 2013, the founder of the largest Afghan NGO, 
a leader in promoting education and health services to women and children in rural and urban Afghanistan, especially the poor and the disenfranchised. We're pleased to announce Dr. Sakina Yakubi of the Afghan Institute of Learning as the 2013 prize winner. Thank you very, very much. I am so honored to be here. And I am so pleased to be able to receive this generous um, award from Opus Prize. On behalf of the women of Afghanistan, and behalf of the children of Afghanistan, I thank you. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. For me, it is very, very hard right now to think, but I want to just thank a few people. <laughs> but um, I, I, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. John DeJoyo, the president of Georgetown University, for your generosity, for your kindness, and for excellence in the university, and for your very talented students. I am so honored to be here and thank you very much for all the service that you provided for us, especially for this award. Thank you. And also, I would like to thank Thomas Banchoff and Catherine Marshall from the Berkeley Center. I am dedicated to you. You are wonderful people. And when I came to Berkeley Center, you were so kind and generous. And today, really, it is a day that I will never forget in my entire life. Thank you very, very much for this wonderful award. And I would like to thank the students of the campus of Georgetown University. I would like to thank all of you, colleagues, friends, everybody who is here, because it is your support, it is your belief, it is your sincere, love and care for Afghanistan, that we were able to do what we have done so far, and we have a long way to go. Thank you for being with us. Really appreciate that very, very much. Finally, I want to say to Opus Foundation, this is the most generous award that I ever got. You know, <laughs> raising money to support a $3 million project is not easy. It's very hard. And you know that I'm a social entrepreneur, and I really would like to do many, many things in Afghanistan. But with this generosity, now I can do things that it was my dream. My dream was to work with young group young men and young women in Afghanistan, to create the environment for them to come and sit together and have an ideation symposium, to discuss issue of the day, to discuss issue of Afghanistan, why we have so much trouble. I want to use this to have a gathering with a lot of networking with a lot of different organization. And in order for us to work, Together, this is a service that we could do because one alone, we could not do that much. But when we do networking, we could do a lot. And I'm really going to use this for that kind of purpose. And then also, I would like to use this to really educate the people of Afghanistan, especially the young, the youth group. 
because as all of you are students here in UNO, you are the leader of future. We look up to you. As today I said, we really must this world. We really didn't do a good job. Today, we are looking to you that you correct and you don't do the mistake we made. Today, the world is a very horrible place, but God wants us to share, to learn, and have a better place, especially peaceful place. Thank you again. Opus Prize, Opus Foundation have been fantastic generosity that is toward people of Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. I have the sense that this is the beginning of a very beautiful friendship. Uh, we're now reaching the end of this momentous ceremony, award ceremony. Uh, and before we leave, uh, first we will hear from a very important person, uh, Don Nyrider, uh, the executive director of the Opus Prize Foundation, who's been our close partner uh, from the very beginning. Uh, and then we'll hear a closing prayer by Imam Hendi. Uh, and everyone here is invited to join us in a celebration and reception over uh, in Healy Hall uh, with President DeJoya. Uh, thank you. I've had the uh, privilege of being associated with the Opus Prize um, as a staff person almost from the beginning. And you would think after 10 years, I would be smart enough uh, not to let myself be on the program following uh, three people like this. But um, I want to add my thanks on behalf of the Board of Directors of the Foundation to um, President DeJoya for accepting our invitation to uh, Tom Banchoff uh, and his staff for the wonderful work that the Berkeley Center has contributed to the Opus Prize. And uh, Tom and I were talking last night and I was saying to him that um, each year it seems that there is always one person uh, on the staff of the host university whose work is above and beyond the call of duty. And um, without that work, um, all of the wonderful events that have taken place this week would not occur. And this year, that person is Aaron Taylor, who is sitting over here. Please stand. I personally am deeply grateful for all that she has done uh, and uh, would now like to ask her to stop sending me emails at 5 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Uh, on my way here this week, I was uh, reading a magazine that uh, was talking uh, about uh, 72 people who are changing the world, and one of them was Pope Francis. And they quoted Pope Francis as saying that when banks fail, it's a crisis. When people go hungry or are sick or are homeless or uneducated, they're ignored. But that is the real crisis in our world. And it struck me when I thought about Sister Carol, when I thought about Fakih and Lise and Hussein from Famina Institute, and when I thought of Sakina Yakubi and her wonderful staff, that these are three people, five people actually, who recognize the crisis in our world and are doing something about it. And I thought a lot about all of the wonderful people who have been recognized by the Opus Prize in its first 10 years. And I tried to think about what sets them apart from people like you and me. In many ways, they're just like us. They grew up in families like ours, even if it was far away. They made the mistakes that you and I made as children. But at some point in their life, they drew deep down on their faith, and that's what sets these people apart. They drew on their faith to try to change the world. This past week, one of the things I learned being here at Georgetown and seeing uh, um, our finalists interact with some of the students here is how uh, not only how committed so many of you young people already are here at Georgetown, 
but how uh, in many ways, I, I remember when I was in school and um, would not have been described as an exceptional student, we always described the exceptional students as scary smart. Well, there are a lot of scary smart young people at Georgetown. And I would uh, hope that you continue, as so many of you already have, to draw on your faith and to do the kinds of things that Sister Carol and Femina and Sakina Yakubi are doing each day in their lives. We need you. We need you to continue to change the world. Thank you again for hosting us this week um, and know how grateful, deeply grateful we are to the university for all that you have done and for the example of these three uh, wonderful people who are now part of the Opus Prize family. Thank you. Before I offer the benediction, I just want to say this. You could just tell that religion does not separate us from one another. Christians, Jews, and Muslims coming together to do the work of God. Religion unites, does not divide. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Almighty, loving, and merciful Creator, give those we honor today all the strength they need and the courage they need to continue to be the voice for those suffering in this troubled world, and that they may find hope and strength in faith and in your love. And give us their fellow citizens the ability to hold them near to our hearts, to stand by them and keep them in our prayers as they do your amazing work of justice, service, and love. We ask for your blessings, God, on Dr. Sakina, Sister Carol, and Fahmina Institute for their great work in becoming a voice for the vulnerable and in their work to uplift the human spirit and to promote human dignity. A special blessing, God, we ask for those leading the Opus Prize Foundation for their real commitment to global peace and positive change. It is you, God, who taught us that by serving each other, we are reaching out to you guide the recipients of these awards to use these awards to continue to bring about a world in which we live with each other with a mutual respect. Continue to make them amongst those amongst whom who are in love with the humanity, not publicity, and in love with justice, not money or fame. May our love of God open doors for unconditional hospitality for all God's creation. May our joint hands free more divine energy lost in the maze of wars. May our faith in God overcome uncertainty of the future. That our scriptures may lead us to more coordination that our prophets may take our hands to mutual understanding, that Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad may instill in us the longing for true partnership on the path to global peace and human dignity, that each and every one of us may become a prophet's voice for justice, justice for all that every one of us may become an ambassador with a loud voice for humanity. We cannot walk alone, God. Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim. So be our companion. Grant that all women and men will come together and join together in a great fellowship of truth, 
justice, freedom, and love. With a united voice, let us all say, Amen.